Okay, let's uh, answer some questions. Let me scroll back up to the beginning here. Um, I don't think we have that many this week, so I should be able to get through all of them. First one, I'm an applied subscriber struggling to understand the risk management process associated with running a theta portfolio. Would it be possible to allocate a section to explaining how to exit a position on IBKR and the impact that movements in the underlying have on the margin requirements? I'm running a small account and looking to generate 10 to 20 percent returns over the years. So if you size your theta correctly, you should not uh, have to manage your margins. You should have more than enough margin. That's why we start small. So you say small account less than 100,000. So if we took the 100,000 multiplied by 0 0.001, uh, well, that's 100K over here, and multiplied it by 0 0.001, that should be the extent of your theta that, that, that you uh, have exposure to. If you, if you start with that level, let me just uh, give you a number here. I used to be able to do all this stuff in my head with decimal places, but <laughs> as you get older, you have to use a calculator. $100 is uh, your theta target. Um, and um, if you stay within that target, uh, you should not have an issue with margin requirements. You should not have an issue with it. Uh, as you get better uh, with this, following your rules, finding the appropriate underlines, you can't just do this with any old underline. Uh, so you have to try a whole bunch of them. Uh, and as you make your mistakes, you learn from your mistakes. You say, okay, well, the implied volatility of the ones that I lose on uh, are typically over 40%. So let's forget about those. Let's find something a little bit lower in terms of volatility because when we're selling premium, we're drawn to big premiums. Well, big premiums come with big risk. They come with uh, big implied volatility. As you develop your list of underlines uh, that work well for you, not every month uh, uh, will every single one work. In any given month, you may say, these ones are good. The next month you may say, okay, these ones are in the right position. The next month you may say, this one's back again, but these, these are okay. These ones are fine. And over time, you'll develop a list of stocks that you feel comfortable with, uh, that when they drop to a certain price, you don't mind selling puts. When they rise to a certain price, you don't mind selling calls. Uh, then you'll raise this to uh, 0 0.0015, and then eventually you'll move to 2 then 2.5. Once you start getting there, then we start thinking about, okay, how do we manage our capital requirements? Because uh, what you don't want is to be living at the edge of your capital. Uh, because any move, any down day or any day that moves against you, uh, you'll hear that ding where uh, a, a uh, underlying position that you have is automatically being liquidated unless you take care of it yourself. So if you size your portfolio right to begin with, 0 0.001 for a beginner, uh, you'll be well within uh, the requirements that you need for your margin. Uh, when you roll in the money puts, surely you are taking a gamble if you hold until the day of expiration, as it's likely you will get assigned. On the puts, yeah, you, you run the risk that, uh, that it may be assigned. Uh, but if it's assigned, you can simply sell it the next morning. It's not a big deal. You can simply sell it the next morning. Uh, through IB, you have access to Globex, uh, depending on what kind of stock it is. If it's a very liquid NASDAQ stock, you can sell it as early as 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but you can usually uh, uh, sell them in, in, uh, in uh, pre-trading. Uh, if you are uh, down on the contract and you have to roll over, isn't it like uh, realizing a loss? Well, you know, you're going to have your rules. Your, your rules simply are uh, your take profit and your take loss rules, and you're going to stick with them. If you feel that something is moving against you and you can buy yourself, you know, and you're looking at the underlying, you say, okay, well, I don't think the underlying is going to hang out here. I just... I'm, I'm wrong on my timing on this because something else is going on that caused the underlying to move in a direction that you didn't think it would go. Sometimes, if you're very familiar with the underlying, rolling forward and rolling down is a viable option. Uh, other times, especially when you're unfamiliar with the underlying, follow your rules.
Follow your rules and you'll stay out of trouble. Follow your rules. You're playing probabilities here, right? Uh, working through portfolio construction. Question on the momentum names. Uh, when we risk manage by selling in the money, out of the money calls, do we treat these call options with the same take profit loss rules as our theta? Nope, nope. These are not income plays that you're making. These are risk management plays. You're lowering the risk of the underlying position. For example, if key were to rally, would we look to take losses on the calls if they hit our downside? No, we would not. No, we would not. We essentially wave the white flag once the momentum names hit our dollar delta beta threshold and leaving the call options on. That's basically what you do. It's a momentum portfolio that you're holding. You're looking for momentum. Uh, if a momentum disappears, what are you doing? You may as well, A, take the loss, or B, see if you can manage your way out of the loss, keeping in mind, of course, that you're still tying up capital. So you have to say, well, how much can I recover? Uh, and, you know, if you're not lucky, how much can you recover? You sell an in-the-money call. You say, okay, well, if that get, gets called away, I'll have lost $350 instead of uh, $570, and I only have to wait two weeks. Well, then that's worth it. Uh, but if you're doing something where you're tying up capital and you suddenly have to wait six weeks just to save yourself $50, if you're going to lose $600 and you might work it down to $550 by waiting six weeks, that's not an effective use of capital. You simply will get better at this over time. Uh, it, is, it is something you have to do. You know, you, you take losses for a while. Uh, till you uh, start thinking, well, maybe I can try to salvage that loss. Then you'll start doing that for a while. And over time, you'll find that some were worth it and some weren't. You have to look at the ones that were not worth it and the ones that weren't worth it probably didn't have a lot of time value uh, in the premium when you sold it the in the money portion. All of this takes time. But you have to start simple, you have to make mistakes, you have to revisit those mistakes and ask, why did I make these mistakes? And sometimes you do everything right, but Mr. Universe shows up and punches you in the face. Like Mike Tyson said, we all have a plan till we get punched in the face, right? And the universe does show up every now and then and punches people in the face for no reason other than it likes it. Uh, question on your duration trade. If or when rates go down and you get that duration boost, are you planning on selling and taking the profit? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Or staying there and let duration boost melt away. No, I wouldn't do that. Uh, why would I? Uh, as soon as I get the duration out of it, as soon as I get that kind of return, uh, then it is time to shift back into take that money out of long bonds shift back into equities because the gain on the bonds have been made uh, the yield would be low and anything that causes the central bank to aggressively cut rates is going to be bad for equities uh, so bonds will rally for a while because the central bank won't just cut rates in one move it'll be over a period of two three quarters maybe even a year that they'll cut rates so you hang out with your bond and you selectively sell when you think some parts of the equity market are on sale. Uh, and you move out of duration and into beta at that time. So no, I don't plan to hold it uh, till maturity. I'm not, I don't need that kind of allocation. I don't need that type of security and I'm not that old. Uh, if looking for duration, what is your view on principal strips versus regular long dated treasuries? Do you see them as inherently more risky, given there's a service provider in between? No, I, 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 I wouldn't say the service provider makes it more risky. Um, the strips are being argued more thinly traded. You will have a wider spread between bid and ask, and it is um, there's different tax treatments uh, for um, uh, for uh, how that underlying is treated. Uh, which can get complicated depending on what jurisdiction you're in. Some places, uh, if you buy the strip at, let's say, 70% of face value, uh, that there is no capital gain in it. It's all interest. Some jurisdictions say, well, it's a zero coupon bond. Hence, all the interest is in the price. There is no duration to it uh, or no capital gain. 
Others uh, would have a, okay, you bought it at this price, it matures at that price every year to determine the interest component that you have earned, that you must pay tax on. You must calculate what the price of it is at the end of the year using the effective interest rate method uh, and then claim that level of interest. Uh, so when you do sell it, it's a question of whether or not it was all interest or if you sold it above the, uh, the uh, amortization curve, is that the capital gain? It's just complicated. Uh, and yeah, it is, it is more thinly traded, wider bid-ask spread. It just seems easier to, be in, to try to find a low coupon bond. Money is not meant to control people. Rather, it is meant uh, to be put to work producing more money for you. You cannot build wealth without putting money in its rightful place. No, okay. Uh, if owning the 25-year bond gives out better yield than TLT and gives similar duration exposure, is there any advantage of owning TLT over the 25-year bond itself? The options, the ability to, uh, uh, if you have, let's say, 10,000 shares of TLT, uh, you can get a little bit more aggressive with the options than you normally would uh, because you own a, 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 the underlying, so you can, you can use the options uh, to manage risk. If you think, well, we've had a good rally in bonds, I'm going to sell uh, you know, calls on TLT $5 up one month out. So $5 out of the money one month out, generate a little extra, uh, a, a little extra yield on that. With the bond, you're not going to get that done. Previous video, you mentioned you are familiar with Russell Napier's financial repression. I have seen his his uh, YouTube videos, and he he sort of presents it in almost every talk that he that he has. He re represents it, uh, in which he sees savers and bondholders ultimately picking up the bill for the government's endless spending. Mm. Since you uh, just bought the long end of the curve, do you not share Napier's concerns for bonds? Uh, well, when he says that uh, savers and bondholders picking up the bill, it just means that, that you're going to get higher yields. So if you are a bondholder now, um, you have higher yields ahead of you, which means lower prices. Uh, so if you're the increment, if you're the marginal buyer, you're always buying at the higher and higher yield. I bought the 25-year uh, at the August 25-year will be specific about which 25 year I bought it at 4.62 percent uh, so maybe the people before me who owned it at three percent have already paid uh, uh, for uh, the largesse of government spending maybe if it goes to six percent then I pay a little bit but I'm gonna get my money back I'm gonna get it back it's just a matter of when I'm gonna get it back and how I'm gonna get it back but I'm gonna get it back um, in the end, it's the taxpayer that has to pay for every single penny a government spends. It's got to come from you somewhere. It has to come from you somewhere. So this idea that, well, you get money and you get money and you get money uh, 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 every year when they, when they put the budget out sounds great. But in the end, they got to come back and get it from you. Whether they're going to get it through more user fees, whether they're going to get it through a higher sales tax, whether they're going to get it through higher property tax, whether they're going to get it through higher income tax, whether they're going to take away most of your parents' uh, 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 estate when they pass it on to you as a higher and higher estate tax because, of course, we can't perpetuate intergenerational wealth, says the liberal. Uh, they're going to get it from you. They have to. Uh, where else are they going to get it from? They can't tax a citizen outside of their country. They have to get it from the very people uh, that, they, that they represent. So we have got to become better voters. We have got to demand uh, that there be balanced budgets, even if that means that we lose a little bit of service here, a little bit of service there. Well, then it's the people who use those services that should pay for those services and not be socialized for everyone. But... I would, I would say that the taxpayer should be the one that is far more concerned than the bondholder. Uh, question regarding the sale of TLT to purchase 25-year bond. Here in the U.S., this type of move may be considered a wash sale due to the fact that securities offer you the same exposure. Well, um, not really, no. They are distinctly different in nature. One is an ETF, one is a government bond. So, for example, 
this would not be considered a wash sale. Let's assume there was a mutual fund that owned 10 shares, and I own shares of the mutual fund, and it owned 10 uh, different uh, companies. And I sold my share of the mutual fund at a loss, and I simply just bought the 10 companies. That's not a wash sale. That's a distinctly different uh, uh, different, um, different securities that I have right there. That is not a, a wash sale. So I'm selling an ETF um, and buying a particular bond. Well, I'm buying a 25-year bond. Uh, there is, there is uh, uh, you know, let's assume that TLT doesn't even own that bond. I mean, I'm buying a very particular bond. Yes, it was an ETF that had fixed income securities in it. And I was able to replicate the beta and replicate the average maturity by buying a bond. Um, it would be the same as saying, okay, well, I'm going to sell my GM shares. And I'm going to buy something else that happens to have the same beta as GM. Have I uh, uh, done a wash sale? right so it's it, that's going to be difficult to get done now if I sell TLT and then I buy a call and sell a put on TLT and create a synthetic uh, that that you got me on there I've created essentially the same security so you can't get that done but for what I'm doing no I I, I, I think it would be a, a hard a hard thing to prove in court that I've that I've uh, uh, done that. I could just say, look, I wanted to get into bonds. There was bonds. I wanted to get out of ETFs. What? What are they the same, Your Honor? I, I didn't know. I don't know. <laughs> Regarding the portfolio management series, I was unable to watch the last two videos as I was preparing for level one. <clears throat> since a lot of detail of prices, market action has changed since you posted the videos, I was wondering what the best way might be to catch up. So this is, I, you know, I have to use prices, uh, but in no way is this time sensitive. Uh, this is something that, that, that uh, you can do any time. It's the process that matters. The prices that I get are the prices that I get. Uh, I am letting you make a whole bunch of decisions on your own as to what you buy and uh, what you're going to sell puts on. I do a couple to show you the process, and then after that I say, you know, pick, pick your own. Uh, it's the rules and the process that you want to extract from what I'm doing. <clears throat> Uh, and when I say, well, the price of this was this, and now the price of that is this, I'm basically just saying, you know, I bought, I sold it at 70 cents. My take loss is at 140. It's now at this price. That's that. That does not mean that that you're lost if those prices no don't apply to what you're doing that day. Just you follow the rules. You follow the process. The price is meaningless. Uh, let's see, you were asked how many years it took for you to become an expert. Well, I'm still becoming an expert. <laughs> Your answer was that you were constantly learning, and that the first years were not exactly learning. Only for the last seven years or so, you've been consciously and systematically learning. Uh, a little longer than seven. I was wondering how you realized you needed to improve the ways you are learning and how you went about it. Um, you know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know till you know it. So you may think uh, that you have a good diet until you learn a little bit more about food and then, and then you say, you know what, um, I do this one thing and that's a terrible thing to do. I, I, I thought I had a good diet, I guess I don't. You may think you have a good workout uh, routine until you learn more about physio, uh, your body, uh, how your body uh, uh, burns calories, uh, the interaction between uh, your blood type uh, and, and the type of foods you eat and how it burns those. Then you start saying, wow, there's a whole bunch of stuff I didn't know, and you start to get better. So it's not until you actually start attempting to learn things you do not know. Uh, once you start that, then you start to realize how much better you can be because of some things that you're doing going, well, I didn't know this. Now I know this. And because I know this, I shouldn't do that. I've done that in the past and I shouldn't do that. Uh, and that's all it is, 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 you know, if you're waiting to jump into the pool until you're an Olympic swimmer, you'll never get in the pool. Every Olympic swimmer got into the shallow end and started flailing their arms uh, to try to stay above water. Uh, and slowly they learned how to swim. Now, they didn't, they, they, they don't just become an Olympic swimmer, right? You got to jump in the pool and for the first little while, you're going to, it's going to look ugly. 
And eventually you'll get some style, eventually you'll learn a little bit more, you'll uh, progress. If you stop learning, then, then it's hard to ever know what you don't know. And it's what you don't know that will get you in trouble uh, in this market. Uh, let's see <clears throat> how the current high interest rates might affect the pricing of both calls and puts. <clears throat> it tends to increase the price of calls and lower the price of puts. And how that might alter certain option strategies like whether it favors short, short long maturity calls versus short ones. Whether to favor short long maturity okay i'm not i'm not following all the modifiers short long maturity calls versus short ones or whether to favor short puts over long calls will stop well the <clears throat> the price of the put increases the uh, or the premium on the put increases the premium on the uh, sorry the call increases the pr the the put decreases such that when you create a synthetic you'll find that the zero cost synthetic is at a price higher than the spot price the longer out you go it's basically centered around the underlying's forward price because those interest rates show up in the options uh, could you share some opinions about around option trading in times of high interest rates <clears throat> they are what they are uh, just understand that that uh, when you uh, go out in time if interest rates are flat you can go out a year uh, let's say that you have a stock price doing this you can go out a year and you can create a synthetic pretty much at the price uh, where the stock happens to be um, and this is let's say this is one year out <clears throat> you're creating a synthetic. as the interest rate rises this is where the zero cost synthetic starts to go it starts to go higher which means the stock has to rise first to the level of your synthetic and then start making money that is called the carry you have to first overcome the cost of carry how would the cost of carry oh look at that good segue how would the cost to carry a treasury bonds affect the yield curve steepener trade well there's no cost to carry on the bonds i think you mean the futures contracts used uh to create a curve steepener trade would there be an overall positive carry from being long, the, the positive carry of the two-year and short the negative here? Yep, you will. Those two will, to some degree, offset. I'm not going to say it'll, they'll perfectly offset, uh, but they'll offset. If interest rates falling, will take a lot of value out of long-dated option premium. How would the TLT calls trade have really worked since, well, Delta's the biggest thing by far okay so if if TLT goes up because interest rates are dropping if TLT interest rates drop and TLT starts going up that has the biggest effect on options the interest rate at that point becomes meaningless um, it's the Delta which means the move in the underlying Delta is by far the biggest influence on on premium prices um, I remember one of your videos mentioning you believe commodities could be one of the asset classes to outperform next three to five years. Yes, I do. Uh, where are you looking to get exposure? Copper is the big one. Uh, just because of every, everything that needs to be done. You're building out solar. You're building out wind. Utilities are, 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 are building those out. They're phasing out coal-fired power plants. You're electrifying the car fleet. Uh, not only electrifying the car fleet, but you want all those charging stations around? Well, they take a lot of copper as well. So copper is how I'm playing it. Are you taking direct futures contracts? Nope. Or ETFs such as... Well, okay, so I'm not going into... I'm going into a very specific commodity. I think copper is going to be the killer commodity uh, going forward. Uh, so I'm not really getting exposure to a whole bunch of them. Just, just copper. At this point, just copper. At some point, aluminum sounds uh, interesting, but I need to see a lot more EVs or the, the uh, ramp up of EVs increasing dramatically. Then, then uh, aluminum will start to, to look very interesting. September is one of the worst months, uh, performed months of the year. Any thoughts on why or is it purely coincidental? I don't know why. If you look at all 12 months, one of them had to be the worst, one of them has to be the best right unless they're all equal 
uh, over the last 20 years, one of them is bound to be the worst. One of them is bound to be the best. Uh, I know you love the short call on ES with a double carry. I'm surprised, however, to see you looking at December 15th ex expiration on the December contract rather than typical 45 days to expiration. Short option rules. Uh, okay, is there a reason you're looking at this extended short option position at 37 Delta? Um, no, there's no, there's no reason why. Uh, I have to have all my positions closed by the end of the year. And it just, just was a nice one to target. Uh, no particular reason why. It has nice premium in there. Um, I, I sold some today. I think my average my average on the positions I have now is almost at 100 points. I sold, I think, some at 80, uh, some at 90, and today it got to like 106, 107. So I sold some there. Uh, not much. I am dipping my toe back in this pool. Not much. I'm being very cautious. Uh, but no reason. Just uh, just something that I like. In respect of your reallocation plans, you mentioned you've considered Singapore. Just wondering if you consider incorporating a company. No, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, Singapore is a city state, um, and I'm not a city person. I, I don't want to be... Uh, right beside someone and right on top of someone else with someone right on top of me. I mean, I just I can't do that and I don't want that. Plus, uh, I have looked at the investor requirements. Um, they're not they're not small little things. They're they're quite significant. So uh, probably not. Not at this time. Uh, leaving aside the fact that you're leaving Canada, do you consider long bond a good trade at the moment? Yeah, I do. For the last few weeks, you've been focusing on the fact that you're leaving Canada when it comes to TLT. So it serves my purpose, is is what it does. It's it's kind of like a nice intersection. Is I like it, and it serves my purpose. So it's an easy decision for me to move into. Uh, if you haven't been losing money on TLT so far, uh, and you've never been in TLT, would you have initiated a new position on long bonds? At the, yes, I would have. Yes, I would have. Absolutely, I would have. And uh, I'm doing this on a Tuesday night. At uh, 9 p.m., TLT is recovering nicely from the lows it put in, what, seven, eight days ago. Uh, and the 25-year bond, uh, I think, it finished today over 79. I was I bought it, some at 79, bought some at 78. 76.15 was the last purchase I made. Uh, over 79 now. I'm quite happy with the position. What is your typical response when friends, family ask for investment advice? Well, I have no family, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, I avoid it. Uh, I just avoid it, or, or or I'll just give a category, you know, or or or, or something, uh, you know, like buy the broad market index, buy an ETF that tracks the index, and just just have, uh, you know. Uh, uh, a contribution plan uh, that you're going to put so much in uh, every quarter or something and just just let just let time do what it does uh, but I don't really have too many uh, friends who are not uh, you know quite sophisticated at this so it's not like I get a lot of um, people asking me for advice I have no family which is which is sort of a nice thing in that respect uh, watching this today is the UK government is set to scrap the EU directive. Um, okay, whatever. In a bid to free up land for construction of homes, adding to your section coverage on components of housing, this would constitute adding more land—a fundamental of adding more land by removing reg regulation function. So, changing the fundamentals can, will change the price. If you can change the fundamentals of the housing market, which means more supply, less regulation. A faster pace from the time I buy unserviced land to the to the time I have houses built. If you can shrink that down and increase supply, yeah, that's how you change the pricing. Is to change the fundamentals. I heard somebody on on uh, Bloomberg today talk about the housing bubble in 2007, 2008, uh, and you know. In my mind, I was correcting him, saying there was no housing bubble in 2007, 2008. 
housing at that time was reflecting the fundamentals of wickedly high demand. The bubble was in mortgages. Uh, you had liar loans, ninja loans. Ninja loans was no income, no job, no problem. Here's your mortgage. You had liar loans. Well, a liar loan is uh, you go and you say, I want a mortgage on this house, but you know my income is rather low, and they tell you, just lie. That's called a liar loan, and that was fine. You had fraud everywhere. The bubble was in the mortgage market. The housing market was just saying, look at all this demand. Look at all this demand. But the demand was, was detached from the fundamentals of the credit quality of the borrower. Uh, so the, the, it was the mortgage market in where you saw the bubble. That thing blew up. And when that blew up, housing prices reflected the new fundamentals, which was there really wasn't that much demand and now everyone's selling. There's this massive amount of supply and housing responded to that. The bubble in housing didn't burst. The bubble in the subprime mortgage market burst and then that then affected housing. Right now, uh, when we look at the price of housing, we got uh, housing price index today and up again, up again, uh, and it is reflecting the fundamentals. You can say, but this price is really, really high. Yes, because the fundamentals are really bad. You have a bunch of people uh, who own homes now with very low mortgages who are saying, normally at this point in my career, <clears throat> I'd upgrade to my next house. This is a nice house, two bedrooms, uh, two bathrooms, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, whatever. Uh, 1,800 square feet, I want a more significant one, but I am not going to get out of my 2.5% mortgage just to get into a 7.5% mortgage. I'll wait. So for existing home sales, that supplies off the market. Uh, so you have a massive uh, drop in supply, yet you have household formation still going at the pace that it's going with new home construction well below the level of new home uh, new uh, new household formation something has to give and that's price you're squeezing price up so uh, being that you can trace the price to the fundamentals that's not a bubble something causing those fundamentals may be a bubble but housing prices are reflecting the fundamentals you want to lower housing pricing uh, you have to change the fundamentals. Uh, let's see. Where are we? Holding TLT 110 calls. Still have them. Uh, they expire in January. Yep. Are you still holding these? Yep. Are you selling them now? Nope. Not really. I made my money back on those. I, I bought the uh, 110 calls and then I slowly worked off the premium. So they're free. In fact, uh, I had made money, more money than what I spent buying them. So they're free. They're free at this point. So I have I have no desire to sell them. So they're at this point they're lottery tickets. I'll hold them. Uh, which are the relevant interest rates in a carry trade? Uh, the overnight rates. Uh, whatever the overnight rates happen to be in each of the currencies. For a young, wealthy individual with high risk tolerance, what is an acceptable range of allocation to the 20 to 30 year treasury bond? Uh, well, you are taking on risk here because you are taking on duration. Uh, and when you're buying when everyone is selling, that is risky to do. Warren Buffett will tell you that's the safest thing to do, but it is it takes it takes some guts to do that, to step in when everyone is screaming sell, 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 when you even have big hedge fund managers saying that they're shorting that asset, uh, and you step in and you keep buying uh, with all of that. Um, that does take guts. It's, it does take a, a level of uh, risk tolerance. Um, yeah, tw if, if you're young, uh, you know, usually we think about the 60-40 portfolio as sort of just a, a general portfolio to use. If, if, if you have a high level of risk tolerance, you can go to 70-30 uh, and put your bonds uh, in the 30 uh, in the 30 percent category. You mentioned the housing affordability is difficult even for you in your housing market. Well, it's not difficult for me anymore. What I, did, what I did say was when I had a professor salary, if I had to just rely on my professor salary, there was no way I was buying a house. And that's, that's back in 2014, 2015. 
uh, in the Toronto area. If I had to rely on only my professor salary, I was not buying a house. Um, so, could you say what price range and type of property you would be comfortable buying? Well, at these points, I can buy pretty much anything I want. So I'm, you know, I'm good. Uh, do you have a favorite metric to value a stock? I personally like enterprise value uh, to free cash flow, but I have not seen many others using this. It depends on it depends on what you're valuing. Uh, are you valuing a utility? Are you valuing a mining company? Are you valuing a bank, a mortgage REIT? You cannot use the same metric for all those for all of those because some of them are valued uh, uh, would be better valued uh, another way. Are you uh, valuing a, a, a food distribution company? Uh, they're typically valued at a multiple of sales. Uh, so it's it depends on what it is that you're valuing. There is no one metric that is great for everything. Uh, it all depends on what it is that you're valuing. Are you selling covered calls against your copper stocks or just holding shares for now? Not selling any, not selling any calls on them. Not yet. Good insights on housing concern. North America, I have mostly seen wooden houses. Back in India, we usually build uh, houses out of stones and concrete. Uh, that could just be uh, access to materials. Perhaps there isn't a good softwood uh, uh, timber uh, market in India. Uh, and perhaps uh, it is not, uh, maybe it's transportation systems, whether it be railways or uh, over the road, perhaps where the trees are, uh, once you harvest them, you simply just cannot get them to where they need to go. Maybe there's a lack of sawmills. Uh, there could be a whole bunch of reasons why one material ends up being the preferred uh, one to use, and it's usually because of access, usually because of cost. Uh, not not necessarily because you know one area has figured out that this is the way to go. It just could be for other reasons, right? The wood is only for doors and windows. Do we have that kind of construction here? And I am assuming it is a lot more expensive. Uh, I don't know. Uh, if you want to build a uh, you know a uh, a stone and concrete house, I imagine you can. Uh, if you go to coastal areas, uh, at least down in Florida that I've seen, the the uh, are, are on the coasts. The structure of the house is poured in concrete, as opposed to uh, as opposed to wood, simply because of the hurricanes. Um, it depends, uh, you know, if if you're uh, in certain areas of the country, there probably is no need. To, to incur the extra cost of stone and brick. Now, wood is wood is just fine. How does the spread between 10-year treasuries and 30-year uh, fixed rate mortgages affect agency MBS? Uh, well, the underlying of the agency MBS is the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. So, right? Could it be that AI is starting to kick in the productivity bucket? Well, let's be clear when we say AI, you know, let's be clear what we mean. Uh, there is generative AI and there is predictive AI. Predictive AI has been around for about 20 years, if not longer. Uh, it, it is called predictive analytics, right? That's been around for quite some time. If you, uh, you know, uh, run a regression and you use that regression to forecast, ah, there's predictive analytics. There's there's a form of AI, right? The difference between you doing it and the computer doing it is the computer doesn't have any preconceived ideas of what it's looking for. It looks for patterns in the data. It learns. That's machine learning. Predictive analytics have been around for a long time. Generative AI is what everyone is talking about when you talk about chatbots, chat GPT, etc. That is generative AI. Um, no, I don't think that this is really leading to a lot of productivity gains just yet. I'm not going to say it has no productivity gain, but it is in very specific applications uh, at this point. Yeah, at the margin, there's some productivity gains, but it's nowhere near 
uh, what the promise of generative AI is if you go out like let's say 50 years where do you think that's going to be in 50 years colossal um, if this is the case uh, you probably see some quarters of high productivity growth uh, even due only to base effects mm. uh, well for base effects probably uh, but I don't think AI my thesis holds true uh, then as you mentioned this would be deflationary hence good for bonds yeah however the market may start pricing in higher GDP growth expectations I don't know what the final effect on bond pricing would be don't know either this is also consistent with low unemployment rate as companies will adjust the workforce only after a couple of quarters yeah I I'm, I'm not I'm not going to bet on a massive generative AI revolution at this point can you elaborate on why uh, would one get burned on triple levered ETF? Well, you just have to do some math, right? Take uh, take an underlying uh, uh, stock and lower it five bucks, then raise it five bucks, then lower it five bucks, then raise it five bucks. You'll have a hundred dollar stock. Uh, now take this, figure out what this is. That's five percent triple levered, fifteen percent. Take your uh, take your ETF and lower it fifteen percent. Uh, if it's $95 and it rises 5 bucks, that's 5 out of 95. What percent is that is? Triple it and raise it. You'll get just to below where you were. Then you'll go down, then you get just to below where you were. Then you'll go down, then you'll get just to below where you were. And slowly and slowly, you'll walk yourself to zero. Over a number of years, that thing will walk itself down. Uh, because it is daily return. Daily return right so that's why uh, you want to avoid these for the day okay if you need something for the day that's fine make sure you size your position right because it's 3x but if if you're going to hold it for multiple for for any period of time uh, and the market is going to do this kind of thing right well that sucks that sucks for a triple levered for any levered ETF what you need is the market to do this day after day consistently move in the same direction or it moves down one day next day it finishes down next day it finishes down it finishes down. you need it to move in a direction for a period of time if you plan to hold it otherwise it will walk itself to zero Having watched quite a few of your recent Outlook videos, you seem to be bullish on long-term government treasuries. Uh, is there any particular reason you're interested in treasuries over corporate bonds? Well, corporate bonds have a uh, credit spread. So now I have two sources of risk. I have duration and I have, I have uh, well, you know, standard duration interest rate sensitivity. And I have credit spread sensitivity. It is quite typical when uh, you have times of stress for credit spreads to widen as interest rates are dropping. So I will not get the same duration out of uh, corporate bonds that I would get out of bonds that have no credit spread with it whatsoever. So you have uh, um, uh, duration, uh, which is a sensitivity to interest rates. And then you have your spread duration, which is sensitivity to credit spreads. If interest rates are dropping, bond prices tend to increase, but credit spreads tend to increase as bond prices are dropping, pushes, pushing prices down. So some of the price gain is taken away from you by the credit spread widening. Regarding your comment that the bubble could potentially be spread between corporate profits and compensation of employees widening. Well, not quite. I said the bubble could be between the share of corporate profits in, uh, as a uh, or corporate as a share of GDP versus uh, the uh, share of wages uh, versus GDP that the bubble could be within there not between corporate profits and wages but the resolution would be yeah a, a return to uh, mean reverting levels uh, let's see are you leaning towards the idea that corporate profits would drop or compensation of employees increasing you don't actually have to have, uh, well, these, these are shares in GDP. So you don't necessarily have to have corporate profits that drop. Uh, if you have GDP increasing at, let's say, 5%, you can have corporate profits increasing at 3% and wages increasing higher than that. 
and the share of wages in GDP would revert from 43%, maybe back up to 50%, and corporate profits would revert back down to 6%, their mean reverting levels. So you don't necessarily have to have corporate profits drop, just their share in GDP uh, would have to change. And that would mean that corporate profits growing at a slower rate than GDP grows at. How would you invest today given assumptions? AI is not a fluke this time. In two years, intelligence on par with 120 IQ human is achievable as a cloud service for multiple providers. Mm, companies can employ AI remote workers, each with great memory, unwavering focus, ability to parse and understand a dense page of text in seconds, easily copy the scale up. The team is needed, text and voice call interaction with human co-workers, fixed cost per AI man hour. Uh, how would I invest today given those assumptions? Um, I don't know. You know, you look at sites like Hugging Face where there's a lot of um, available models that you can simply just use right away. Uh, and if that continues on, well, which company is going to have the model? So you're going to need a platform. Well, I shouldn't say a platform. You're going to need some place to have it. So data warehouses probably will do very well. Look at Digital Realty. Uh, since um, uh, NVIDIA reported, uh, started the whole AI wave with their uh, earnings last quarter. Uh, DLR was around 95 bucks. Where is it now? 130 bucks. Uh, just, just on that. Just on that. Um, I think uh, also it'll be companies where uh, the headcount could be massively reduced um, in, specific, in specific areas. And if you can get that done, uh, well, I think those companies will be the winner. So you'd look for companies with, well, I mean, large companies that generate a whole bunch of, that generate a whole bunch of their own data. They can then take open source models, models that have already been created, uh, and train those models uh, on their own proprietary data without the resulting model leaving the enterprise, without all of that without the result leaving the enterprise so that they have their own uh, you know internal model that was developed externally but is now uh, trained on their own data sets uh, so it'll be companies that can either enhance the value of the product that they offer or, or massively reduce headcount uh, now if you have 15 companies in an industry all doing that and all decreasing headcount the very competitive nature of the industry says there will also be uh, uh, um, it, not everyone's going to keep the margin that the margin will go back down to industry margin so if you have an industry let's say 15 players in an industry and the average operating margin in that industry let's say is 40 percent and they all implement AI and they can all save significant money such that one of those companies are demonstrating that they can get 60%, but in time they'll all get to that level. Competition will drive prices down back to the 40%. So it's like a one-time uh, a one-time boost and once that boost is in there, then it's it. That's it. So uh, you have to think about, well, what what... What is the continual, what's the tail look like of this thing? What's the continual generation of something and who, who's going to be doing that? I don't know at this point. Uh, incremental and marginal mean. Uh, incremental uh, means just uh, the very next one. Marginal also just means the very next one as well or the very next, the very next increment that you make. Uh, why do you think agency MBS are screaming by? Because not only are yields high, but the spread between uh, uh, between yields and uh, fixed rate mortgages is super high. Uh, what are your current thoughts on Alcoa? It hit new lows last week. Seems to be under heavy selling pressure. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I haven't spent too much time with it in the last little while. I think it it is uh, a big China story because China has a lot of smelting capacity. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you back an animal in a corner, it comes out, it comes out fighting, no matter how small that animal is, no matter how big you are, it'll come out fighting. You back an economy into a corner, you back companies into a corner, they come out fighting, uh, which means, that, you know, producing as much as they can 
to try to reach whatever market they can, lowering the price to get to whatever market they can if that's what they need to survive. So, you know, it's asset intensive. And when you have businesses that are asset intensive, you need volume. Uh, so they may, you know, the fear is that, well, if, if there is a pullback in demand that's significant enough, you could have a whole bunch of dumping uh, in different markets out of China because these, these smelters need volume. Uh, what is your view on the wheat market next few months considering supply disruption from East Europe? I don't know that that's really being reflected in prices anymore. Is The weather has been very favorable uh, to, to the grains. Uh, wheat, I think, today, December wheat, six bucks uh, in Chicago. I don't know. I, uh, I, would, uh, I think it would take a lot, given where we are, end of August, it would take a lot to pull that, uh, to pull a rabbit out of that hat at this point, I think. Uh, level three on Saturday, any last minute? Not really. Any last minute advice? Not, not really, other than lean into it. Talked about detached home in the video. What do you think about downtown Toronto condos? Good developer selling 1750 per square foot pre-construction. <laughs> Look at that price, $1,750 per square foot. Uh, and with high construction costs, on the end, there are plenty of supply for condos. Old ones selling at $1,100 uh, per square foot. $1,100 per square foot, I want you to think about that. That is, you know, that is quite high uh, in that respect. You know, thousand square foot condo, which isn't isn't uh, a very big house or a very big thing to live in, really, at a million dollars, if not more. And then, of course, all your condo fees uh, that you have to keep paying on top of that. Uh, do you think condo prices are in a bubble? Not, not if there's demand. Not if they're selling. Um, it, it, to be in a bubble again uh, this is the easy test to determine if something is a bubble is it is the price completely detached from the fundamentals uh, if the answer is no if the fundamentals are there it's not a bubble in 1999 you had some dot coms that that are three four five hundred million dollar valuations you know with with no revenues and no hope of revenues anytime soon and no real business model no pathway to cash flow at all some that were worth you know uh five six seven eight billion with nothing nothing to them absolutely nothing there were no fundamentals that was a bubble uh, hello dr marcellus I guess that's me. I don't know. I would like to ask you if you know about the radical economic ideas that uh, Javier uh, proposed for Argentina. No. No, I don't know anything about that. Uh, let's see. Past level three at a relatively young age. Able to find a good job quickly in an international bank. So far, so good. Since uh, then, I felt I'm treading water. I know that uh, continuing education is essential. I purchased the Applied Series, some finance book, but I've lost the motivation I had when I was preparing for the exams. My free time, I procrastinate, watch Netflix, play games, having a well-paid job, stable life. External drive to keep improving is gone. Starting to hate myself for that. Uh, what advice uh, would you give? Well, I don't have to give you any advice. Uh, you have a... You have something going on, you're starting to hate it. I don't have to give you advice. You already have it within you, right? You recognize it. But here's the thing. Uh, it's okay to coast every now and then. You know, uh, if you get university out of the way, you do your three levels of CFA, you get a job, it's okay. It's okay to take a couple of years and say, you know what? I'm just going to hang out here for a while. Why do I always have to constantly be on the path? Can I stay at this hotel in this little city for a couple of years and then and then I'll get back on the path? And you'll know when it's time to get back on the path. You'll wake up one morning and you'll say, you know what, enough of this, enough of this. But until then, it's okay. I mean, I've had those periods uh, uh, where you just don't feel like doing anything. You just want to, you know, just do nothing. And it's okay. Get it out of your system. 
uh, you've, you've clearly reached a, a good level quickly. Um, it's okay to coast. It's okay to take a year, two years, and just enjoy where you are at this point in time. Enjoy the city that you happen to be in. And then you'll wake up one day and you'll say, no, nope, it's time to get back on the path. Then check out of that hotel and head back on the path. And, you know, who knows where it's going to take you, but uh, it'll take you somewhere where once you get there, you can say, okay, well, now I'm going to hang out here for a while. It's okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's exhausting. Uh, always having the pedal to the metal, always always pushing yourself, always feeling guilty for for spending an hour watching mindless TV. It's exhausting. You burn yourself out after a while. So this is natural. You're just recharging. But but you see, you're not complacent because of what you said here. I'm starting to hate myself for that. Which means it's not going to take you long before you decide that okay, enough enough is enough, and off you go. Do you actually work as a professor or teacher in any institution in Canada? Not now, not anymore. Apart from your CFA activities, that's all I do now. You said you're well paid and still don't know if you could afford a house. I said, if, <laughs> this is way back there. I said, if I had to rely on just my professor salary at the time, I couldn't buy a house. That, believe me, that is not the case today. And again, let me just repeat. If I had to rely on only my professor salary, right? I want to buy 30 year strips, so already answered that. Current thought on REITs, apartment REITs, yes. Uh, digital, uh, uh, the uh, digital REITs, like the DLR, digital realty. Uh, any of the uh, uh, REITs that are, um, uh, I'll say data center REITs. There we go, digital REITs, data center REITs. Uh, and apartment REITs, especially in Canada, they're, um, they're being, I think, uh, undervalued only because of where interest rates are. But we got a housing problem. And, you know, when the government starts floating around the idea of limiting the amount of international students that come into the country because there's no place for them to live, you know you have to buy the apartment REITs. I found this on YouTube and it's giving me flashbacks. You must be referring to the Grin Old Kroner model that I threw at you. Uh, where are you planning to move to? Yeah, looks like Costa Rica is in the lead. Um, why not coming to Switzerland? Eh, I don't know. I've looked at it, and you know, still it seems Costa Rica is the one that that you know kind of has the lead on it so far. Quite the gymnastics to deny a housing bubble. I don't think so, but maybe things are different in Canada. Housing isn't too high. Well, housing isn't too high in Canada. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Wages are too low. Gee, I wonder which one will move first. Housing isn't in a bubble. It's just unaffordable. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that's... Um, if you're saying that in a serious way, if you're being facetious or, or what, based on the first sentence. But again, uh, the test here is... If the price is completely detached from the fundamentals, then you can say it's a bubble. But if it's reflecting the fundamentals, it's not a bubble. If you're going to look for a bubble in there, you're going to have to look for something in the fundamentals or some inverse bubble somewhere else. Anyways, that takes us to the end of our time here.